here we are. Now, what we're doing this time, we are going to go dig deeper into the Gospels. So let's begin with Luke chapter 1. This is verse 2 through 4. Luke is telling, giving us his credibility to write this book. And he said, even as the apostles basically delivered them to us, which from the beginning, they were eyewitnesses. They were the ministers of the word. It seemed good to be also having had perfect understanding of everything from the very first to write you in order, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things that you've been instructed. So we know that Luke has a perfect understanding of what's going on from the beginning, and so we want to pay close attention to what he has to say. Now in Luke chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, it talks about in the days of Herod, who was the king of Judea, there wasn't just any priest, there was a certain priest named Zacharias, and he was of the course of Abijah. Now his wife was of the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. So we see he was a priest. To be a priest, you had to be a son of Aaron. Who knows what Aaron's wife's name is, was? What was Aaron's wife? The brother of Moses, clear back there. Elizabeth, Elisheba. And so she was named after Aaron's wife. Okay, so anyway, it says if, uh, it was after the course of Abijah. Now, when we read that, what does that mean? Does that mean anything to us? Now, what does that mean after the course of Abijah? Well, let's take a look and let's unfold this. First of all, look at Luke 1, 8 and 9. It came to pass while he executed the priest's office before God, and notice it says in the order of his course, which is the eighth course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. What does it mean when it says his lot? It means, yeah, they had the lottery back then, okay? They cast lots. Because there were so many things, there were so many priests, let me put it this way, what was the age of the active service for a priest? 30 to 50. And Yeshua began his ministry at 30. But anyway, 30 to 50 is 20 years, right? Everybody got that? Now, if you remember, there are two times a day, they would light the menorah, service the menorah, and they would offer incense twice a day. There's 365 days in the year, times two, you're looking around 700 times a year that the incense would be offered. Does everyone follow me? Well, here's the problem. There were 10,000 priests. So what are the chances of you being one of the 10,000 priests, all of them wants to offer the incense? Why? Because when you offer the incense, you're right next to the Holy of Holies. And if you wanted to talk to God and put a petition in there, hey, you can't get much closer. All right, so they all wanted to be the one to offer incense because that way they could talk to God. Well, when you take that 730 times a year, okay, that means over a 20 year time frame, uh, doing it twice a day, there's only 14,600 times that someone can offer the incense over 20 years. But there's over 10,000 priests. So what are the chance of you winning the lottery to be the one to do the incense? They made a rule that if you won the lottery to do the incense, you can only do it once in your life. Every other thing you could do as many times as you would win, but that only once in your life because you might be on the bench like at a basketball game for 20 years. Everyone wants to participate. As a matter of fact, it wasn't just the incense. There, what they would do because there were so many priests, they would break every step down what they did. One person would win the lottery to clear the ashes. Another one to slaughter the lambs. Another one to splash the blood. Another one to clean the incense altar. Another one lighting the menorah. Uh, you know, and so they made this rule. You can only burn incense once in your entire life. Then you could not take a part in that lottery. Now, we also see that he was of the course of Abijah and he executed the priest's office, it says, according to the customs. Well, look at 1 Chronicles 24, 1 and 2. This is where they get that from. It says, these are the divisions of the sons of Aaron, 
the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, but we know Nadab and Abihu died and they didn't have kids. Therefore, Eleazar and Ithamar executed the priest's office. And then in 1 Chronicles 24, 10, we see the eighth course went to Abijah, which means this was the course that Zacharias was from. And then in 1 Chronicles 24, 19, it says, these were the orderings of them in their service to come into the house of the Lord. And again, according to their customs. Okay, so there were 24 courses, right? That was what we just read. They would serve one week twice a year. And 24 times two is 48. And then during the three feasts, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, when there'd be 2 million Jews in Jerusalem, all 24 courses would be there to help. So if you were uh, like the third course, oh, let me show you this, okay? Nisan one is the beginning of the religious cycle. So let, we're gonna pretend this is Nisan one. The first course works the first week of the year. The second course works the second week of the year. But what happens? Then you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread for a whole week. So whoever served the second course has to stay and work a second week. And then this would be the third course. You following? Then we have the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, and the course of Abijah was the what? Eighth. So this tells us it was around the first week of June that Zechariah ministered. But here's what happened. The very next week is the Feast of Pentecost. So he had to work two full weeks, his course, and then with everybody. And what the Lord is so smart. Can you believe it? He makes sure there's 2 million people there for Pentecost when Zechariah has his vision. So everyone gets to see this is a special moment in history. And watch this. In uh, Luke 1, 10 through 12, the whole multitude of people were praying. When it says whole multitude in Greek, the word is plethos, where we get the word plethora from. There's like millions of people there. And what do we find? They, uh, everyone was praying without at the time of incense, which would be around the evening sacrifice around three o'clock. And then an angel appears to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When it says the right side, is that southeast, west, or north? Okay, let's think about it. The temple faced, that's east. The temple faced east, right? And Zechariah is west because the altar of incense is there behind his holy of holies. And then right is which direction? North. Exactly. That's where Gabriel was standing. And it says this, it was, uh, he was on the right side of the altar of incense when Zechariah saw him uh, and he was very troubled. Well, look at verse 13 through 15. The angel said to him, hey, don't sweat it. Fear not for your prayer is heard and your wife, Elizabeth is going to bear a son and you will call his name this. You know, it's interesting. Whenever it says you will call his name, that tells you that that guy's got the authority. Your neighbor doesn't name your kids. You name your kids. Well, have someone come and say, this is what you're going to name your kid. Okay. And he says, you'll have joy in Gladys and many are going to rejoice when he's born. He will be great in the sight of the Lord and he can't drink any wine or strong drink. What does that mean? He's taking a Nazarite vow. Je who else had a Nazarite vow? Uh, Samson. Remember, look at this. The angel of the Lord appears to Samson's mom and says, behold, now you are barren and you don't bear, but you're going to conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, be what I pray you. Don't drink any wine or strong drink. Don't eat anything unclean for you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, let's look at Luke 1, 17. What does this say to Zacharias about his coming son? It says, he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Okay, well, if you remember, that's what Malachi says is supposed to happen. And so he's thinking, wow, the Malachi verse is being fulfilled. 
And th- now, imagine this. John the Baptist is growing up, and his parents are telling him about the vision that he had concerning who he is. And uh, John the Baptist's dad says, you're going to go in the power of Elijah. Well, if I was John the Baptist, I'm thinking, cool. I may go up to heaven in a chariot of fire, just like Elijah. You know, I can hardly wait to get those wheels. But what happens? He's stuck in prison about to get his head chopped off, which is why he asked the Messiah, yeah, are you coming to get me out of here? Or am I going to have to stay? I thought I was going to be like Elijah, you know. But look at Luke 1 18, Zacharias says to the angel, well, how am I going to know this? I'm an old man and my wife is old. Well, guess what? That's the same thing Abraham said in Genesis 15, 8. He says to God, well, how am I going to know this? I'm an old man and my wife is old. But Zechariah gets punished and Abraham doesn't. That's not fair. But look at Luke 1, 19 and 20. The angel says, look, I'm Gabriel that stands in the presence of God. When I hear that he stands in the presence of God and God's supposed to be in the Holy of Holies, that's almost like Gabriel was always there and he just appeared, like he never left. But there is the heavenly temple as well. But then he says, you will not be able to speak until the day that the baby's born because you don't believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their season. When it says fulfilled in their season, what does that mean? It's going to be at an appointed time. It's going to be on a moed. And what day was John the Baptist born? On Passover. Isaac was born on Passover. Okay? And here, John the Baptist is born on Passover. And who's supposed to come on Passover? Elijah. That's why they have the Elijah's cup. And he's going in the power of Elijah. Now, how long was Zechariah speechless then? Nine months. Actually, it was about three weeks after he conceived. So about nine and three quarters. Right around there. Look at Luke 21, 22. Because it was from Shavuot that the announcement came clear to Passover when he was born. Just a little over nine months. And so what do we see here? Uh, it says in Luke 1, 21, 22. Remember, this is Pentecost. Shavuot. There's like two million people in Jerusalem. And... The people were waiting for Zacharias and they were marveling that he took so long in the temple. And when he finally came out, he couldn't speak. And they perceived that he'd seen a vision because he beckoned to them and remained speechless. Okay. They were wanting to come out. And what was he supposed to do? Talk. When you come out, you say the priestly blessing. They were waiting for him to come out and say the priestly blessing. And it's like, blah, 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 you know. And so what do we see here? In um, Luke 1, 26 and 27, it says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, the same one who had talked to Zacharias six months earlier, Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Okay, so it's the sixth month. When did Zacharias have the angel appear to him? What feast? Pentecost, which is in June, as you can see, in the middle to the end of June. She gets pregnant right about in here somewhere. Okay, well, six months from the end of June, July, August, September, October, November, December. It's the end of December when the angel appears to Miriam, and what's at the end of December is Hanukkah. First day of Hanukkah, last day of Hanukkah, the angel appears to Miriam in the middle of Hanukkah, which is the very same day the flood rain stopped and the rainbow appeared. Okay, this is when Messiah was conceived as the light of the world in the middle of the festival of lights. So that's when he was conceived. And then it says this in Luke 1, 30 through 33, the angel says to her, don't worry about it, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You're going to conceive and bring forth a son and call his name Yeshua. He'll be great. He'll be called the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. Wow. His father was supposed to be Joseph, 
But because it says the father of David, this is telling us this is the Messiah. Okay? And he's going to reign over the throne forever. That's a long time. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. So this is telling us he's the Messiah. And this brings us back to Isaiah 9, 6 through 11. That says unto us, a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace will be no end upon the throne of David and upon uh, uh, his kingdom to order it, establish it with judgment, with justice, and henceforth even forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. There were three types of people who were anointed. Who were they? Kings were always anointed. Prophets were always uh, anointed. Priests were always anointed. And uh, amazing is the Holy Spirit is what is symbolized by the anointing. Okay? And the Holy Spirit comes down upon Yeshua. And he is anointed as all three, prophet, priest, and king. Okay, now, look at Luke 136. It says, Behold, he tells Miriam during Hanukkah, Your cousin Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. What's amazing about this is both ladies had miraculous births. Elizabeth had a miraculous birth in her old age. And we find Miriam has a miraculous birth. But of course, Elizabeth is a whole lot older than Mary. Then it says in Luke 156, Mary abode with her about three months. Okay, why did she abide there with her for three more months? It was the sixth month of pregnancy. You had three more months. It's for the baby to be born. Okay, and you go from the end of December, three months to the end of March. What do you have? Passover. That's when he was born on Passover. Okay, and now... Look at this, what happened to John the Baptist when he was born. It says, it came to pass on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. How long is Passover? It's seven days and then the eighth day, it's eight days. So here we see John the Baptist born on Passover, circumcised on the eighth day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it was that day that the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. It's a complete cutoff. And eight is new beginnings. And so here I find it fascinating. And when you tie him to Passover, you can see the eighth day of Passover. Okay. And then they mention that John's going to be his name. And so now Zacharias' mouth is opened. Now look at Luke 1, 68 through 70. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation. And then it says, uh, for us in the house of his servant, David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Do you realize there's been prophets since the world began? It says Enoch was a prophet. There were prophets all through uh, for thousands of years. And look at this in 2 Samuel 22, verse 2 and 3. Here it says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my rock, and him will I trust. He's my shield and he is the what? The horn of my salvation. So when they call the horn of salvation, it's referring to God. My high tower, my refuge, and my savior. And what's the Hebrew word for savior? Yeshua. And you saved me from violence. What's the Hebrew word for violence in English? Hamas. Not hummus. Hamas. Okay, now look at Luke 1, 76 through 79. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. To give, now here he's speaking about John the Baptist. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercies of our God, whereby the day spring from on high is visited us uh, to give us light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way. Okay, well, look at this. I find this uh, fascinating. In Psalm 107, 8 through 10, 
They cried to the Lord or the Yudhe Vafe in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distress and he led them forth by the right way for they must go to a city of habitation. And then it says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men, for he satisfies the longing soul, fills the hungry soul with goodness, such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. Well, I think it's fascinating. In Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 2, it talks about the people that walked in darkness. They've seen a great light. They that draw in the shadow of death upon them has light shined. Wow. Now watch what happens in Luke 180. John the Baptist, he grew. He was strengthened in spirit and he was in the desert till the day of his showing to Israel. You know what's fascinating about that? Do you remember that Zacharias and Elizabeth were old? That means when he was young, probably eight or 10, his parents are dead. A lot of people have suffered where they're uh, an only child. How's that to be an only child and your parents die when you're about 13 years old? Well, that was the case with John the Baptist. They're dead and he's wandering in the deserts, but he's in the wilderness for a long time. But listen to this. This reminds me, your notes are done, but I have more verses. So you just have to write them down. Listen to this. This is in Luke 2. This is verse 6. Oh, and let me say this. If in the end of December is when Yeshua was conceived, if you add nine months, where does that take you to? That takes you to the end of September. He was born on the Feast of Tabernacles. He wasn't born on Christmas. He was born on the Feast of Tabernacles. And how many days long is the Feast of Tabernacles? Eight days, seven days, plus one day, the eighth day known as uh, Shemini Yasseret. So what do we find happens if he's circumcised on the eighth day? That means on the eighth day of Sukkot, here he is shedding his blood being circumcised in the temple, fulfilling the covenant of Abraham about circumcision. This is why when you know the calendar, everything always lines up with the feast days. And then what do we find in Luke 2 verse 6? And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Okay, we'll start with the first thing. What does it mean that he was wrapped in swaddling clothes? Okay, you look it up in the Greek and it's an oriental idea of where you cut garments into strips. What they would do, the priests would have on their white linen garments and they get stained with all the blood from doing the sacrifices. And when they couldn't be worn anymore, they literally would cut the priestly garments into strips, put them in wicker baskets in the women's court of the temple. And the women could take the strips home as they needed them. And they would to wrap their child in swaddling clothes, which means Messiah literally was wrapped in the linen garment strips of the priests of the sacrifices for sins. That's what he's wrapped in. I mean, that is just amazing. The other wicks that would also be used to light the candles at the 70 foot tall uh, lamps that were in the women's court. They would use them for that as well. And then when it says there was no room for them in the inn, why was there no room for them in the inn? It's a code, you got 2 million people there. And if you don't get your reservation in, you're not gonna have a room. Let me ask you this. How many of you want to go to Alaska for vacation in the winter? Okay, who wants to go to Hawaii for vacation in the summer? All right, what you want to do, I mean, who wants to go to the, uh, the Dead Sea in Israel in the summer? Not, it's a desert, it's hot. Well, it's the same thing. 
Yeshua couldn't have been born in December because no one wants to go to Jerusalem in December. There would have been all kinds of room in the inn if he was there in December. He wasn't. He was born at Sukkot when everybody has to be there from every nation. And they didn't call the hotel soon enough. And so there they have to, of course, everyone's in tabernacles anyway. Also, because they all had to be in a sukkah. What they do, they have a nice hotel or whatever back then. And then they would go in their sukkah for the day. You know, so the dad, the husband might spend the night in the sukkah, but the women and children might be in the hotel room or whatever. And then look at Luke. This is uh, chapter two, verse eight. It says, and there was in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Well, guess what? At Sukkot, what do they pray for to happen? Rain. And what happens all winter in Israel? It rains. It even snows. There's no way again he could be born at Christmas because it's pouring down rain and the shepherds have already put all their sheep in the fold. Right after Sukkot is when they put their sheep in so they're not out in the rain. They wouldn't be watching their sheep at night in the rain or in the snow. And so then we find in Luke 2, 21, when the eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Yeshua, which was so named of the angel before he even was conceived in the womb. Okay, so then after those eight days, they go home, you know, but then what happens? In Leviticus, it says that after you have a boy or a girl, you have to go through a purification process. Well, let's start with Luke 2, verse 22 through 24, and look at the process. It says, and when the days of Mary's purification, according to the law of Moses, so that's what it had to be based on, were accomplished. Then they brought him back to Jerusalem. In the case you don't know, it was like 30 days a month. They brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And then look what it says. To offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Did you know that's not what it says in the law of the Lord? But it says it was. Well, it's not a hundred percent. It's only about 90 percent. So let's go back to the Torah to find out what really happened and what does that tell us. In Leviticus 12, 6 through 8, it says, when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she's supposed to bring what? A lamb is what she's supposed to bring. That is of the first year for a burnt offering, and then a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to the priest. So it wasn't two turtle doves or two pigeons. It was a lamb and then one turtle dove or a pigeon. But wait, there's more. It says, the priest that will offer it before the Lord and make an atonement for her, and she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. This is the law for her that has born a male or female. But look at the next verse. Here it is. But if they're too poor and they aren't able to bring a lamb, then she could bring the two turtle doves or two young pigeons, one for the burnt offering, one for the sin offering, and the priest will make atonement for her and it shall be clean. So what that tells us, the Magi have never come yet. And it's been over a month and they're very poor. They can't even afford a lamb like the law of the Lord requires. They can only bring the two turtle doves or the two young pigeons. How many of you know they really would love to have had a lamb? Well, they did the lamb of God. They had the lamb of God. He's just going to be sacrificed a little later, about 33 years. But anyway, this is when you connect the dots, all of a sudden the whole New Testament takes on a whole new look. All right. There's any more. Let's stand. We'll close with prayer.